all that. So um, they went off on, they, you know, pulled aside the interstate, and, and they was wondering what they was going to do. And there was this piece of, I don't know what exactly it was. It was sort of like paneling looking thing. And so anyway, um, they was able to cut the piece out, put it up there, and get Mr. Mike's uh, camouflage duct tape, and off they went. And uh, so everybody, you know, knows we're from the south, I guess, or a duck hunter or something. But, uh, and I told Brother Evan, I said, well, God had that piece of whatever it was there. And uh, so they're, they're doing fine. And they'll stop tonight around 1030. Uh, but there was in Lenore, t Tennessee, just a little bit ago. So uh, anyway, they're, they're doing great. Everything's fine. Um, other announcements, please don't forget us this upcoming Wednesday night. We love to share Wednesday night um, Bible studies with you. I'd love to have you come be a part of that. Um, also, the Back to School Bash is going to be here at the church on Saturday, 28th of July, at 5 o'clock instead of Miss Susan and Mark's home. It'll be here. Um, also, the 31st of July, Senior Adult Cover Dish, Lunch and Bingo. And uh, so if you would, don't forget about that. Deacon Election coming up August the 5th. So we'll have that and, uh, in a week or two. That'll, that'll be happening. Pray as to the, who the Lord will have you to, uh, to vote for in that. Also, just... Uh, notice the bullet 108,000 that's what we owe on the building so we're coming on down with it and we're excited about that so that's all the announcements we're going to share with you we'll let you um, read the bulletin and uh, order service and you can pick up on what the other stuff that we're doing um, just have there um, if you will lead us. let's stand together let's worship the Lord tonight hymn number 38 awesome in this place As I come into your presence, pass the gates of praise into your sanctuary till we're standing face to face. I look upon your countenance, I see the fullness of your praise. I can only bow down and say, I come as I come into your presence past the gates of grace into your sanctuary till we're standing face to face I look upon your countenance I see the fullness of your grace I can only bow down and sing to him tonight. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place, I'm a father. You are worthy of all praise. To you our lives we raise. You are awesome in Timothy brings a message, Lord, and just please all feel all sick and hurt. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.
Thank you, Julie. As we continue in worship, we're going to sing hymn number 152, 296, and 104. You can remain seated. There's not a friend like a lowly Jesus. No, not one. No, not one. None else can heal all our souls' diseases. No, not one. No, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend like the holy Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. There's not an hour that he is not near us. No, not one, no, not one. No night so dark but his love can cheer us. No, not one, no. Savior given. No, not one, no, not one. Will he refuse us a home in heaven? No, not one, no, not one. Jesus knows all about our struggles. He will guide till the day is done. There's not a friend the holy Jesus. No, not one, no, not one. He is exalted, the King is exalted on high. I will praise him. He is exalted forever, exalted and high. will praise his name. Put Julie on the spot. And Julie, we're going to do some favorite hymns, okay? All right, let's do some favorite hymns tonight.
We'll do as many as time allows, okay? Six oh one. Seen the first verse, 601. You need another book, Haley? She did not know we were going to do this. Some glad morning when this life is over. Sing the third. Just a few more weary days and then I'll fly away to a land where joy shall never end. I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. Two twenty four. Two twenty four. Two thirty. Four forty seven. Keep spitting them out. I know Julie can remember them. What was the first one? Two two twenty four. Next one to what? Two thirty. Let's do the first and the last.
Was it Mr. Travis? 447? Did somebody say one something? Okay, all right. 447. First and last. Just the guys on this verse, just the ladies on the second verse will sing the chorus together, okay? Just the guys. When peace like a river attendeth my way, when sorrows like sea billows roll, The ladies on the floor. Somebody else. 566, and then we'll come back to who? 556? Okay, 556.
once a lamb. Amen. Over here, four ninety nine. Two twenty-seven. Okay. These young people scared me with it. Okay. If you have your Bibles, if you will, turn with me to the book of Revelation. Get this in my pocket again. Tonight, we're looking in Revelation, the second chapter, in verses 12 through 17. We're going through the seven churches and uh, the letters that uh, these seven, about these seven churches. The church at Pergamum. We're going to look at the church at Pergamum tonight, a church that's in the hot seat. This is uh, part one of two parts. And uh, if you would, let's just follow along as I read in God's Word tonight in Revelation chapter 2, verses 12 through verse number 17. And to the angel of the church in Pergamum write, the one who has the sharp two-edged sword says this, and of course this is the, red words of the words in red of Jesus, says, I know where you dwell, where Satan's throne is, and you hold fast my name, and did not deny my faith, even in the days of Antipas. My witness, my faithful one, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you, because you have there some who hold the teachings, notice what this says, who holds the teachings of Balaam, who kept teachings Balak to, to put a stumbling block before the sons of Israel, 
to eat things sacrificed to idols, and to commit acts of immorality. So you also, you have some who in the same way hold the teachings of the Nicolaitans. Therefore repent, or else I am coming to you quickly, and I will make war against them with the sword of my mouth. And he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, to him I will give some of the hidden manna, and I will give him a white stone and a new name written, on the stone which no one knows but he who receives it. Let us pray. Father, we just pray and ask you would, as always, to bless the reading of your word. And Father, we ask if you would, as we go through this Bible study tonight, help us to understand it, but also help us to make application in our own personal lives. Please be with our, our youth as they are away tonight on this trip. We pray for their safety, but also we pray for their spiritual uh, enhancement as they're on this trip. We thank you for each person that has come. Help us now to clear our minds and our hearts as we listen to you as you teach us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, I had read a couple of extra verses there. We will not get down into about the white stone tonight, but we're going to talk about the church at Pergamon. This is a church that was, was in the hot seat, and uh, I'm going to be mainly teaching tonight about and hear about Revelation. This is the series that we're going through about Jesus' is coming. But as the letters to the seven churches are examined, as you look at these letters here, it's very interesting to note that there's cities that these churches were dwelling in and they were located. And so tonight we're going to look at Pergamum, and it seems that if each one of those cities had its, a very unique um, something about it, a peculiarity. And, for example, there's two things that stand out in the city of Pergamum. And again, this is a two-part message, and we won't be going real long tonight. But first of all, it was a center of instruction. Now, in the city of Pergamum, it was one of the most famous, and it was one of the largest libraries that they had in the ancient world. It had over 200,000 volumes. It was a place of intellect, and that's a city. It was next to the library in Alexandria, as far as the size, it was the largest library in the world. And so one of the interesting things that I, I found out in the use of parchment. How many of you know what parchment is? What is parchment? Paper, right. And so this is, to me, I, I just really like these little nuggets, and so I want to share one of those with you. Uh, the use of parchments, this, uh, the, and also the skins of animals, they use that as writing material. And it was actually invented or founded in Pergamos. And so the name parchment, it comes from the town of Pergamos, and so the Greeks, were, they were great exporters of papyri, and it was the material from which this paper was actually made. And uh, so they, what happened was is that these Greeks got into a feud downtown with some of the citizens there in Pergamos, and so they decided they were just going to cut off all the supply of the paper to the city. Well, when this happened, they had to figure out a way to be able to write. And the city had to turn to another avenue of written communication. And so what they actually done is that they developed the use of animal skin or a sheep skin as writing material. Now, some of you may have heard that saying uh, when a person goes to college and they finish up their college degree, uh, oh, you received your sheep skin. Now, this is exactly where we get that from. And so your diploma is called a, a sheep skin. So this re that refers to material in which that diploma is written. So the use of animal skin called parchment is a type of paper, and it was invented in the city of Pergamum. We're talking about that city tonight. And, uh, it's, and so in order to understand the spiritual temperature in the city, we need to understand a little bit about the city itself. Uh, this city, of course, uh, it was a, a very learned city. It was a city of education. It was where a lot of scholars actually came into the city to study. So it was a very learned city. It was a city of instruction. Second of all, it was a city uh, that had a center of idolatry. You find that in, the, in, uh, in that ancient world all over that was idolatry. In this, in this city here, it was a built... Uh, there was a temple that was built for four great Greek gods in their mind. You had, there was the temple of Zeus, you had the temple of Dionysius, and also you had the temple of Athena and the temple of Esculapius. And, and in addition to these, there were, um, and of course they were not true, they were false gods, but these were different temples that was dedicated to the worship of the Emperor Caesar. And so the Lord Jesus called this city in verse number 13, he said that this is where Satan's throne is dwelling. And so this church was located right in the middle of those headquarters. And so it was, it was uh, living in the shadow of Satan himself. You could literally 
way they said you could smell the uh, influence that satanic influence it was everywhere because there was idol worship everywhere it was uh, as if the devil's uh, bread was even being made in every bakery and so right in the middle of the city it was a city of, of hell it was a little colony of heaven and it was known as Pergamos Pergamos and some of you here today you may think and when you go through a lifetime that you live in a hellish situation you may be the only Christian where you work and you may feel like you're isolated on an island you may feel like that you're the only Christian inside of your family and you very well may be you may be the only one in your neighborhood who comes to church and who professes the Lord Jesus Christ you may feel like that you're living or you're working right in the middle of hell's headquarters and so as you feel like that you're living or you're working and don't be discouraged though because as we look at these people they had some of that same similar situation uh, we shouldn't be discouraged it ought to encourage us because Jesus says it to this church he said I know where you dwell at times when you get discouraged and you feel like that the world is going against Christianity and it is seemingly more than ever we can go back to this verse and say he knows where we are he knows where we dwell just like he did to this church here and just as Jesus knows where this church was dwelling he knows where you live he knows every one of his children and he knows the discouragement that you may face in this life Jesus knows where you work and in, in your you're, you're most probably exactly where God wants you to be. Sometimes we ask God to remove us from situations. But maybe he has you right where he wants you to be. God's put you where you are that you can be a witness for him. And so it was these people down in Pergamum. They were in the middle of ungodliness and, and a lot of persecution. The Bible says that we are to be the light of the world. Now, where is wherever you put light, it's going to be effective most of the time. You are a light in the world in which we live. And he's going to place us where we can be most effective. It's put in the darkest corner. And that is what God does with us. Wherever, it's, wherever it is the darkest, wherever it is the most ungodliness, wherever you find the most unchristlike, where faith is totally absent, there you will find God puts his people. We have missionaries in the International Mission Board, and God places those missionaries where there's the greatest need. And they can make the greatest impact and the greatest influence. And so right here, Satan dwelled, but God had put his church right here too. And so they were a faithful church. They were a faithful church. Uh, they were not going to let anything stop them. Faithful. I always heard you had a choice to be faithful or not. They had a choice, and they were. They were faithful. They were also a firm church. That, that is, they stood on what they believed. They were firm. They were also a, a following church. You can have a church, but sometimes we can have a church that don't want to follow the leader that God placed them placed in there to lead them. You, and, and, but they were a following church. They wanted to do what God wanted them to do. And so they were also a fruitful church. They wanted to bear fruit. And so, but they were a church that camped out on the doorsteps of now, Jesus deals with this church in three ways, and I want to talk about that tonight. And the three ways that he deals with this church, and he has some things to say about most every church that we're going to be studying. First of all, he, com he commends their loyalty, and he commands loyalty. So, and that's the same with us today. God wants us to be loyal. Uh, Jesus begins by commending the loyalty of this church. He points out to the church that they are living right where Satan's throne is. And so that Greek word for throne, it literally means a seat of authority. That's what that means. And so what the Lord is really saying is, I know that you're living in a place that Satan is in charge. And, and you see, contrary to popular belief, Satan is not the king of hell, although he may think he is. He's the prince of the power of this world and this age. And this church was located, again, right on the devil's doorstep. It was living in hell's hallway. And so it was surrounded by a den of demons. And yet they were, uh, they were loyal to the Lord Jesus. Boy, you talk about your faith being tested. You have people like that around you. And our flesh side says, God, come get me. Get me out of here. I don't like this. It's hurting. It's too much pressure. Uh, Lord, get me out of this situation that I'm living in. But we have to go back and think, well, maybe God put me here for a reason. If he's placed you there, he's, he knows what you can do and what you can't do. And he's entrusted you with, with a ministry, with a work in the midst of the, the corridors of hell. 
And so, but also we find here that there's loyal in their confession. Look at verse 13. It says, you hold fast to my name. Now, what does that mean when you hold fast to my name? Well, that is they refused to, to keep quiet about the Lord Jesus. They would not deny the name of Jesus. In other words, I guess they got into a crowd and there was a bunch of folks that was lost and didn't know the Lord and they was the only one there. They'd speak up. You see, they, they knew the power of the name of Jesus. For the Lord Jesus said in John 14, in verse 13 and 14, And whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that my Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. They also knew the preeminence of the name of Jesus. And for Acts 4.12 says, Nor is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given, whereby which we must be saved. They knew that those idols were not real. They knew that there was no salvation, no, no power in those idols. They knew the presence of the name of Jesus. For the Lord said, Matthew 18, 20, For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there will I be in the midst of them. And so they had a firm grip on this. They understood that. And so as we're continuing on our study here tonight, I want us to look here. They had the purpose. They knew the purpose of the name of Jesus. For the Bible says in Matthew 1, 21, And she will bring forth a son, and you'll call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. They would not deny the name of Jesus. They loved that name. They sang about that name. They lived their lives in the name of Jesus. Take the name of Jesus with you. Take it then where you go. That's an old song we used to sing a lot and and when I was growing up, and I'm sure y'all did hear. If this, and so if this church had just simply kept quiet about Jesus, they would have stayed out of trouble. If you and I live in a country right now, if we will just simply stay quiet about Jesus, we won't get in trouble. But let me just tell you what, I'm not going to stay quiet about Jesus. I'm going to continue to profess him as my Lord and Savior. They could have talked about the God all they wanted to. Have you ever noticed you can talk about God? But just don't bring that J word up. They don't want Jesus talked about here in this country. Dwayne and I, was, I had followed Dwayne uh, an email, and uh, in that email, it's the Air Force has put out a generic book, and they've taken the Bible out. They have a lady, I don't know what they call her, cause see, she's like a commander over all that, uh, the Air Force, and, and they are, we, we see the very th thing happening here in this country. And that was just this week or, or a week or two ago. And so that's what exactly what I'm talking about. We had that same thing here in our country that was going on right there. They could talk about God. Everybody had a God. I mean, you know, and it wasn't the God. You know, they, uh, it, it didn't matter whether his name was Zeus or Apollo. Everybody was expected to have some kind of God. And, and, but it was when they, they confessed that Jesus was God and that he w alone, he's the only way. That's when they got in trouble. Have you noticed that about us here? Jesus is the only way. Folks get offended. Well, the same thing with them. You know, uh, that is the way it is today. You can talk about God all you want. People don't mind talking about God. Do you know how many people believe in God in America? Do you know how many percent? Everybody believes in God. Most everybody. 93%. I didn't say Jesus. I said God. You see, there's a lot of people that think, you know, well, yeah, I believe there's a higher being. And that's where a lot of them have it mixed up out there. But when you begin to talk about Jesus, it's amazing how people's going to react. It's, uh, if that athlete, if he begins to talk about Jesus, the reporter, he'll quickly cut off the interview with him. Um, one of the things, all right, let's see. Um, do we have anybody that was or maybe still at, uh, oh, goodness, one of y'all had a Bible. Christian athlete, what are they, what's it called? They'll show up a Christian athletes. One of y'all, Grady or somebody, had that Bible and all that. What is one of the things that they have to do after they they score touchdown or they inter get interviewed? Or uh, do you remember y'all heard about what they have to do? I had a college athlete tell me this one time. And uh, fellowship of Christian athletes, they first of all, I'd like to thank the Lord Jesus Christ. And then I'll talk to you. They go into talking. That's what they have to do. I mean, that's, that's their choice to do that. They are in fellowship of Christian athletes. But if you, now, if, if they get interviewed, they'll just cut them right off, you know, and, and uh, the reporter. And so if you have a politician and he's, he's talking about Jesus, well, all of a sudden we have to go to this commercial break. We'll be right back. And they just leave the person. You, 
have you noticed that? And, and so, uh, but do you know why this church stood by the name of Jesus and they kept talking and they kept preaching and they, sharing the name of Jesus? Just couldn't help it. They was in love with the Lord. And that was a natural topic. One time there was this pastor and he visited a couple. He wanted to try to get them and uh, lead them to the Lord Jesus Christ. And the wife said to the pastor, she said to him, she said, one of the reasons that I don't want to become a Christian is because I know this young man that is a Christian. And all that he ever talks about is Jesus, Jesus. And so Jesus is the focal point of every conversation. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. That's all you hear. She then said, preacher, if I become a Christian, do I have to talk about Jesus all the time? And the preacher said, absolutely not. But let me just tell you this. I'm going to be honest with you. If you become a Christian, you're going to fall in love with Jesus and you're going to want to talk about him all the time. And Jesus will be the natural focal point of conversation. Don't know if the lady ever come to know Christ or not. But you see, friend, he'll be on your mind when you wake up in the morning and he'll be on your heart when you go to bed. You remember how it was when you fell in love with your husband or your wife or, or maybe your fiancé, they was on your mind all the time. You, you saw her in every blooming flower and every budding rose you saw it there in every council check I'll just say she's listening um, he's not here so I can talk about him tonight brother Evan we I am so excited he is dating Dan mm -hmm, his granddaughter well I work with brother Evan Miss Beth and she can tell you the same thing and uh who, you know, uh, we'll be this week, we're talking, you know, and I'm kind of conversing with him. And, and I'll say, and I'll repeat the same thing a second time. And he'll go, huh? And I'm like, yeah, I know where your mind's at. And, uh, and so I said, man, I'm excited for you. And, uh, but that's also, the, you know, she's on your mind. He's on your mind. And Jesus is on your mind. When you come to know the Lord, Jesus becomes your conversation. And so you want everybody... To know. Let's just say when you had that baby, ladies, that baby girl, baby boy, whatever it may be, what did you do? Grandma, what did you do? You want everybody to see or either look at a picture. You wanted to show them off. You talk about how much they weighed, how long they were. And, 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 you know, so that's the way it is when you fall in love with Jesus. You just want to talk about Jesus. Also, they were loyal in their creed. In verse number 13, Jesus commanded, uh, commended them. He said, you did not deny my faith. They didn't give an inch on their faith that was once and for all delivered to the saints. Today we would have... Now, this is a, a ne in a lot of people's minds a negative word, but please understand, listen, hear me out before you make a judgment. <coughs> Excuse me. Today these people here in Pergamum would have been called fundamentalists. They believed in the virgin birth of Christ. They believed in the deity of Christ. They believed in the substitutionary death of Jesus. Uh, they believed in the literal physical resurrection of Christ. They believed in the actual physical second coming of Christ. They believed that there was a literal heaven. They believed that there was a literal hell. And they believed that the Bible was totally the word of God. Now, I want to say this right now, that, that if you believe everything that I just said about that, you're classified today as a fundamentalist, although we don't want to be called that. Now, I don't particularly like that term because it's become a pejorative term today as we think about that, but it's a, it has a very negative connotation. But it conjures up the thought of somebody who uh, believes should, women shouldn't wear slacks. If you do, you're going to hell, things like that. I've met people like that. Uh, you shouldn't wear makeup. Like I said before, some pe people thought that we was Pentecost because Brent, Pentecost, uh, Brent didn't wear makeup. And that was just her choice. Her mama did. I don't think she did. And, uh, but, you know, that's her prerogative, I guess, you know. And uh, I guess if you need it, put it on. I mean, you know, I don't have a problem there. It's just expensive, though. That's pretty expensive stuff. And don't you ever think that a, boy, a girl costs more than a boy? Because you talked to me after church about Joshua. And uh, Haley was the one that didn't want to spend much. And Joshua, well, he, if you're going to have a Cadillac and Buick and a Volkswagen, he wants the Cadillac, always. But I want you to know that I'm not a fundamentalist in dress or 
or, you know, or deportment. But I want you to know, I believe God's word. And I am in doctrine. Before I went to seminary, my Uncle Frank, who was a Southern Baptist pastor, and was killed in a car, well, he died later in a car, from a car wreck. Um, he told me, you go to seminary, you're going to hear a lot of things, and you know some of those things are not right. And you just let them go out one ear, in, in one and out the other one. And, and I knew I had my mind made up. I had the doctrine, some of the fundamental doctrines that guided me through seminary and in my life. And so you hear so often about the seminaries, uh, it, it can ruin a student and it, or have a liberal college you go to and it ruins a person. But let me just say this. When a person makes up their mind, no matter what, they will not deny the faith that is found in the Word of God. And these people were commended. They stood firm, strong, true. Heaven and hell together couldn't shake them of their beliefs. Jesus goes on to commend a man here named Antipas, if you're following along, in verse 13. He was a faithful martyr, is what the Bible said. And so one of the, the standout Christians in that church was a man by the name of Antipas. And that word is a, a very interesting word. It literally means against everything. Anti means against, and the word pas, it means all or everything. So this man was a man who was willing to stand against everyone. And everything that if it stood against Jesus, he was faithful even to death because he was a martyr for Jesus. Martyr simply means he was murdered. And so Jesus calls this man a faithful martyr. He'll have a special crown when he gets to heaven. And this is one of the highest compliments that's paid to anybody in the Word of God because that is the same phrase that is used to describe Jesus in Revelation 1.5. And here was a man who stood up against the world. Even though the world stood up against him, they took his life. Somebody once said to John Knox, they said, if you take a stand for Jesus, all the world's going to be against you. And John Knox replied, he said, well, I'll just, John Knox will just have to be against the world. Tonight, we can slide away from what we believe and been taught and what, what we know is true. But you know, he knows our address. He knows your zip code. He knows where you live. He knows your heart. And so tonight, this message is one reason, I think, is a word of encouragement. We are living in a different America than when we were children growing up. As we live in this country and we see some of the same things happen in Revelation in that church at Pergamum, we're seeing happening today. My God has not forgotten us. Our God is, is going to be with us as we go through these persecutions. But as you go, know what you believe. As you live your life, hold firm. Be faithful. And even to the point of death, like Antipas. This is the part one that I wanted to share with you tonight. And uh, I want to encourage you to be loyal to Jesus Christ. It's, it's very important. I'm going to ask if you would, let's bow. Father, we, we can get, we can let our guard down, and Lord, we know we can get, we can just blend in with a crowd, Lord. And Lord, there's times where we should have stood. We should have said something. But Lord, we was worried about all those people around us. But Lord, as we look, at these people in this book and your word even if it cost them they were going to stand Lord you've placed every one of us where you want us and Lord you didn't promise us that it would be comfortable even as these people your believers our church family back in Pergamon they paid the price for what they believed and they would not believe in any other of the idols or the gods although there was strong influence in, in that city they held true to the one true and living God Lord and where you've planted us Lord help us to be faithful when we get discouraged for Lord I know I'm speaking to my own self help us to remember he knows where we live he sees our faithfulness our loyalty. Help us to encourage one another 
as we see the media being like animals and attacking others and other people that are standing for the right are being attacked. Father, tonight I pray a special prayer for these farmers. This farmer and his wife in Seattle, Lord, as they are held in a Bible study and they've been told that they can't do that on their own land right here in our country. Father, as we think about this church on the eastern side of our country they were told they can't have church in the storefront anymore Lord we see some of the same persecutions going on in our land that was going on in Pergamum Father I pray they would hold true, be faithful even to the point of death God forgive us when we've been weak and we've given in and we didn't bring honor to your name how we handle that situation. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to give you an opportunity to respond tonight. You might need to come forward. and if For some reason, you need to do business with God. I'll be down here to help you. You might just need to come pray at this altar. Maybe it's a problem in your life, and you and God. Something about just coming to an altar, you can get seemingly to me just closer to the Lord and closer to the cross when you come and bow down on your knees. That's showing humility. And I know a lot of people, I've pastored a lot of people said, I can't come bow because my knees won't go no more. But there's, I've seen a lot of older ladies, they would always come and they'd sit on that front row. They just said, I had to get a little closer and I wanted to pray for my church. I wanted to pray for my family. I wanted to pray that I would be committed 